Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the APS Stamp Chat. Welcome everyone. My name is Heidi. It's a pleasure to have uh, you on the line tonight. We have uh, a terrific guest. Um, you might have seen him. He was a he was featured in this month's American Philatelist, uh, which is an APS member service, and you get this when you're a member. Uh, so this is Mr. Jim Gates, Mr. James Gates from uh, the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, and he's joining us to talk about cardboard culture card collecting and postage stamps, and we're very, very excited to see him. And I happened to meet Mr. Gates when he visited the APS uh, a few months back in Bel beautiful Belfont, Pennsylvania, and we met in the library. And, you know, it just reminds me to tell all of you that uh, the library, uh, the APRL, is one of the member services when you join to become a member of the APS. The APRL, our library, is one of the world's largest and most successful collections of philatelic literature with over four miles of shelving and 23,000 books, 5,000 journals, and a digital library to boot. That's at the APRL, and that's one of the great membership services that you get when you join the state with the the American Philatelic Society, which you can go to and check out join membership at stamps.org. Friends, without further ado, I'd love to start our presentation where we can escape the, the norm for a minute and forget that there isn't baseball and we can travel back in time with the one and only librarian of 25 years for the National Baseball Hall of Fame, Mr. James Gates and an APS member too. So thank you so much, Jim, for joining us. Friends, thank we you, will Mike. have, oh, excuse me, we will have questions, but at the end, and if you could use the chat box, friends, for your questions, that would be super. Thank you. And again, welcome, Mr. Gates. Thank you, Heidi. It's good to be here tonight. Uh, I've been enjoying um, your stamp chats these last few weeks as I, I find myself at home uh a lot more than i've ever been before uh and it's been nice uh, a nice break in the day to see some of your previous guests and on some of those programs you've talked about crossover collections and uh, i think that's what we're going to cover today and this presentation is is kind of an outgrowth of some research that i did on a new baseball card exhibit that we were doing at the baseball hall of fame where I went in thinking that baseball cards were have always been the dominant genre of the market. And what I discovered was completely the opposite. And then I discovered almost by accident that there's a philatelic connection to this. And so that's what we're gonna cover today. Let me see if we can get this going. There we go. Now, any, um, if you know anything about baseball cards, that this is the big one. This is the Hannes Wagner T206 card. It's a 20th century tobacco card. This is from the early part of the 20th century. And it is the famous card. This is equivalent to the uh, one cent magenta from British Guyana, as far as baseball card collectors are concerned. There are about 70 of these known to exist of which uh, a few are in very good to mint condition and those sell in the millions of dollars for a single card and that kind of gives you an idea of what has happened in the baseball card market is these old tobacco cards start in the hundreds of dollars and then go into the thousands and the tens of thousands of dollars and there's a ridiculous amount of money being spent on these things but the question was, what is the story on the origins of these cards and as a collecting genre? I mean, did they appear magically out of the ether one day or was there a reason that they came into existence? And uh, what I found is that in post-Civil War America, um, you had several things going on. There was a migration going from the rural parts of the country into the cities, and then you had immigration coming in and uh, those people were also staying in the cities and they weren't producing their own food anymore, but they were working in factories as part of the industrial re revolution. Uh, and so the whole economic system of America was changing. Along with that, 
was a fantastic growth in the railroads. Uh, this slide here you can see on the left are the railroads in 1860, which was the beginning of the Civil War. And then on the right, this is the railroad system in 1890, only 30 years different, but the growth was phenomenal. And what this meant was you could pretty much get from any part of the country uh, you wanted to, to any city you needed to get to in, in a matter of just a few days. So with this increased urban population, the Industrial Revolution, and a vastly improved transportation system, you had the ability to meet consumer demand for products, particularly perishable goods, food, tobacco, things of that nature, which they could no longer grow themselves or make themselves. Now, with this mass production of goods um, for the people living in the cities and the ability to deliver those goods, that meant if you were you know, producing something that they needed, you were in pretty good shape. But it was a competitive environment. If you could do it, so could somebody else who was making the same product. This created a need for promotion and advertising. And there's a fun little piece that I found from uh, the 1890s and 1880s, uh, cocaine toothpaste, not sure if that exists anymore, but once upon a time, there you have it. Um, and going along at the same time were some massive changes in printing technology. Prior to the Civil War, Printing was basically one document at a time on a hand press, and it was, for the most part, monochromatic. It was black and white. Books, magazines, newspapers were all printed in black and white. But by the 1880s, 1890s, you had high-speed printing presses that were available. It was called lithography in those days, and they could produce material in color. And that was fantastic if you were looking for a way to sell your product. And along with uh, lithography, you had printing ink and all types of um, side businesses. But here you'll see on the far left and far right are two advertisements for lithographers or printers as we would call them today. And the images used don't really um, push, you know, anything about printing, but it was a showing the ability to get as many colors as possible onto a single piece of paper, which was new and exciting for people who were used to seeing black and white images in everything that they were reading. Uh, the image in the middle is kind of a microcosm of what was going on. The Queen City Printing Ink Company, uh, the Queen City, of course, being Cincinnati. And this company had been established in 1860, right before the Civil War. It was incorporated in 1877, shortly after the war. And this advertisement is from the late 1880s, where you can see they now have branches in New York, Philadelphia, Denver, and Chicago. Uh, so the printing aid companies were expanding uh, to meet the needs of the lithographers who are now creating uh, promotion and advertising pieces for the businesses. This was a, a whole new world. Well, one of those industries was the tobacco industry. It is a perishable good produced uh, in just a few places in the country, mostly Virginia, North Carolina, and believe it or not, uh, Connecticut had a tobacco industry as well in those days. And most of the tobacco sales at the time were in loose tobacco pouches, which was used for chewing or people would hand roll their own cigarettes and cigars. Uh, if you wanted to buy pre-made cigars, you could, those are made by hand. But cigarettes as a product did not really exist because it was just not economically viable to produce them uh, if you were doing it by hand. Well, that all changed in 1881. James Bonsack uh, invented and patented the automated cigarette rolling machine, which could produce up to 200 cigarettes per minute. Uh, if you take that out over an hour, two hour, three hour, four hour, that's a lot of cigarettes. And if you had, say, 10 of these machines lined up, you were producing a lot of product that you could now package, uh, put in a train, and get uh, into any city in America to sell your product. Well, the packaging itself uh, was used to promote it with color images as much as they could. 
And the packages were actually rather soft and could be easily damaged. And so what they discovered was they had to put a piece of cardboard in the package to protect the product. And then somebody came up with the bright idea that, uh, well, we can print on those too. And that's where the idea of the tobacco card came from. And this is where I thought I was heading. I, you know, here were the early tobacco cards, which featured photographic images of ball players, and you know, these were, you know, wonderful things for collectors and baseball fans. And this is what I was expecting to find as, you know, pretty much the only thing that was stuck in the tobacco cards. And boy, was I wrong. And what I did was I went to uh, who I call the master, Jefferson Burdick. Uh, who is the hero of our story in many ways. He is the father of card collecting. Jefferson was born in 1900 in Syracuse, New York. Uh, he, he was a fantastic collector and amassed a, a personal collection of cards of over 306,000 cards, uh, which he, toward the end of his life, he donated to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, where it exists today in the Prince Department. And if you make an appointment, you can actually go and do some research there. Well, he was not only a collector, he had a bit of OCD in him as well. He organized, he inventoried, and he cataloged the collection. And then he began printing list of these card sets in a newsletter, which he eventually turned into an annual card catalog. It was first published in 1939, which is the same year the Baseball Hall of Fame opened, which kind of led me to believe, oh, baseball cards are, are the centerpiece here. Uh, he called it the United States Card Collection first. Uh, in later editions, uh, it became the American Card Catalog. And the focus was on cards that were being printed and included with product in the United States and Canada. Uh, there are some equivalents in other countries. The British Cardophilic Society has their own catalog, which they have produced as well for cards that uh, come out of Europe and the, the British Isles. Now, if you'll remember in that early slide, the Hannes Wagner card was the T206. Well, the T206 indicates the set that it comes from. And I, I never really thought about it. Um, you know, where did the T come from? Who, who determined that? Was it a government committee of some sort? Was it an industry association or a conference or whatnot? Well, as I discovered, it was Jefferson Burdick. One man did it all, and he created a system which is still the standard used today. Now, it's a bit of a peculiar system. Um, he, he really wasn't trained as uh, an archivist or index or anything like that, but he came up with these letters that stood for a different genre of cards. Uh, there were food cards, bakery cards. Um, you can see uh, Canadian cards, theater cards, things of that nature. But the two letters that I want to focus on are N and T. N, which he has here as CNS American Tobacco, has come to be known today as the 19th century tobacco cards. And those were the earliest cards of, of this uh, genre, this hobby. And T are the 20th century US tobacco cards. And those are the most common letters that you see associated with the well-known baseball cards. And so that's where I immediately went to, hoping to find all types of information about these beautiful little cards here that, that are all baseball cards from well-known sets. And it was like, here I go, I'm gonna have a great list. This is what I was expecting to find. This is what I found. <laughs> set after set after set of cards that Burdick classified as actress cards. Um, there seem to be a lot of them. Uh, by today's standards, these are, you know, fairly innocuous, uh, wouldn't upset too many people, but by the standards of the 1880s, this was absolutely scandalous. And there was a massive public outcry about the tobacco company sticking these cards into the tobacco products. And I, I started to say, you know, there seem to be a lot of them maybe more than the baseball cards, and I need to look into this. So, you know, what were the stats? Uh, I deal with stats all the time in baseball, so I figured I could come up with some stats for the cards. And using Burdick's checklist and a couple of other sources that I had, I started uh, breaking down the sets. And let's start with the N series, the 19th century cards. 
I've um, determined there were 527 different sets of cards comprising 31,600 plus cards. And the breakdown was that there were 3,400 on baseball, about 11%. 17,000 um, dealing with uh, in the kind of accurate category. That's over half the cards, 54%. And then 11,000 on other topics. I said, oh, I wonder what I'm going to find when I look at the T-series. The well, the 20th century cards, the first thing I noted, there was uh, you know, half as many sets. The reason for this was there had been a lot of consolidation and mergers and acquisitions within the tobacco industry. So there were fewer companies producing fewer brands. They were making a lot more cigarettes. Smoking had really taken off and there were tons of cigarettes being produced, but with fewer brand names. So there weren't as many sets being produced, um, you know, because it wasn't necessary. And I found about 18,500 cards in the T-Series. The breakdown here was, well, remarkably consistent for baseball, the 3,384 cards, which is almost the same as had been produced in the 19th century, but percentage was higher now at 18%. The number of cards uh, in the women or actress categories had dropped significantly, was still more than baseball, but it dropped from 17,000 to just under 4,000. And then the other categories um, had remained consistent at about 11,000, but now was 61% of the total. So you'll see here, if you look across, um, baseball to remain constant, the other topics to remain constant, but the, the big difference had been just the, the much smaller number of cards uh, in the actress category. And this was you know, clearly due to public uh, demand. Uh, some I've had one person suggest that there were more women smoking after 1900, and that may have led the companies to change. That may be true, but I haven't been able to uh, statistically prove that yet. But wow, there are 22,000 cards on other topics, and the question was, well, what are these other topics? And so I started to uh, get into the list and looking at those, and and found a lot of fun things. There were a number of flag sets, flags of countries, flags of states, flags of provinces, flags of cities. And these were all meant to be as colorful as possible. That was the purpose of the cards, was to bring some vivid color into the buyer's life to help promote the product. Um, one of the most popular card sets were the American Indian Chiefs. Uh, and this is from the late 1880s, the American Indian Wars had just concluded. So it's interesting uh, that the uh, urban population found this to be one of the best sets or one of the most popular sets. And you'll see uh, in a few slides uh, an album that was produced uh, for people who collected these cards. There were birds of the world, again, trying to show as much color as possible. Uh, and then uh, a variety of topics, polar explorers, pirates, American inventors, gems and minerals of the world. Now, there weren't as many actress cards, but the ladies didn't exactly disappear. Uh, this is the musical instruments of the world set. And if you look hard enough, you will find a musical instrument on each of these cards, but I don't think that's necessarily why, why this set was produced. So the companies were using some subterfuge to continue having young ladies appear on the cards to help sell the product. Uh, and then there is one set where maybe not as much subterfuge, just was gods and goddesses, but I only could find goddess cards, uh, obviously teaching classical mythology here to the buyer, uh, but I, I think there were other purposes uh, for this set of cards. And then just to show how the companies were, were selling these as collectibles, you, know, you buy our, our tobacco product, you get the cards and you wanna save and, and organize them. They produced these albums that you could also purchase. They were from 10 to 40 pages in length. Um, they had a color cover, uh, was monochromatic on the inside. But the goal was to get you to buy the album and then you would continue to buy their tobacco product until you had collected all the cards from that series and you would put them in your album. And then of course, about the time everybody had a chance to collect all 50 cards or 25 cards or however many, they would come up with a new, another new set 
with another new album just to keep you going and keep you buying the product. Uh, on the far right here is the American Indian album, which is very rare. Uh, they used basically uh, cheap acidic paper on these albums, so not a lot of them exist anymore, and those that do can be in rough shape. But if you can find a, a good mint quality copy of the American Indian album, uh, they go for quite a bit of money, actually. Now, that's all nice, but are we ever going to get to stamp collecting here? Well, uh, there were a number of philatelic series that were included in the other category. And in the tobacco ones, I, I identified all of them, and I'll give you some background information here on each. The first was produced in 1889 by the Duke Tobacco Company which Burdick classified as the N85 set, and it is simply called postage stamps. It's a 50 card set uh, that has a colorful vignette of somebody writing a letter or mailing a letter or receiving a letter or mail being delivered. And that is a real postage stamp that was glued to the card at the factory. So that when you bought the pack of cigarettes and you opened it up and you pulled out this card, it would have a real postage stamp on it. Um, they weren't added afterward, but th this was done in the factory. And this is the only set I found so far that has a real postage stamp on it. Uh, the 50 cards, uh, some of them are vertical, some are horizontal. Here are four more samples. You can see a lady receiving a letter, a lady mailing a letter, Sir Roland Hill of Penny Black fame uh, in the, the third card. And the fourth card is mail being delivered in winter. And you can see um, different stamps. Uh, they weren't real um, uh, exacting at the factory about getting the stamp centered in the box there. They would just get it anywhere in the box and off it would go. Uh, I think that the American stamp on the far right post dates the series. And I, my guess is what has happened over time is as different collectors have owned these cards, they have soaked off stamps with their own collection and then put another stamp on top of it in its place. Um, I have a complete set of the N85s, all 50 cards in my personal collection. I was able to get them at just under $8 a card, um, which is remarkable when you compare it to baseball cards that, that start in the hundreds. I think I got this entire set of cards for less than what it would cost me to get one baseball card from a tobacco series. And this was one of the more popular sets that uh, Duke produced. They also had a postage stamp album that you could get. And this is a rather um, large album in that it has 40 pages, far more than you need to glue in the, the cards from their cigarette packs there's plenty of room for stamps as well. So this is an album that's a crossover album where you could put both your card collection and your stamp collection. I do have one of these in my uh, personal collection as well. I traded with uh, another collector and uh, was very happy to have this. this. This can be very difficult to find. As I said, the, the paper they used was not very good. But this shows how they were marketing their product and uh, trying to get you, you know, to buy all of these things so you would continue buying their cigarettes over some other brand. Now, that was the only N series on stamps that I found. Uh, this is a T series. This is the T61. It's simply called Foreign Stamps. It's from the American Tobacco Company. This dates to about 1911. Now you'll see, I'm going to be showing some more T series cards in a minute of postage stamps that are higher numbers, but were published before 1911. Burdick didn't seem to organize his T numbers or his N numbers by date. It's more by company than anything else. So um, just because it's a, a higher T number doesn't mean it was printed later. It may have been printed earlier, but this uh, set had Basically, just a printed color image of a foreign stamp on it. Um, there were 50 of them. They were fairly popular, but not as popular as the N85 series had been because there's not as much to look at here. Uh, the Pulliam Cigar Factory produced these in 1906. This is the T132, Mail Carriers and Stamps. It's a 48 card set, and these cards are a little bit bigger. These are about the size of a standard baseball card today. 
and each set uh, or each card showed mail being delivered in a different country. And then on the four corners, there would be printed a stamp from that country. So in this case, it's the mail in the British Indies with four different uh, stamps um, from that jurisdiction. Uh, and like I said, there were 48 of these. They're very colorful. These are very popular. Sometimes you see these coming up for sale at auction and these go for anywhere from five to $10 uh, a card. I have not been able to acquire any of these yet though. 1906, the T-138s, letter carriers and postage stamps. This is from the Basma and Adam Cigarette Company. It's a 48 card set. And uh, this one is the mail in England where you would get a color vignette of mail being delivered and then um, a color print of a stamp from that country. Uh, these were very popular, and I think this is the next set that I'm going to try to track down for my own personal collection. I don't have any of these yet. Now, once you step outside the country, you don't have the verdict numbers anymore. And this is a set from Great Britain. The Ardeth Tobacco Company was printed in 1939, showing that they didn't really stop at World War I like the American cards did. They kept going. Uh, it's called Stamps Rare and Interesting. It is a 50 card set. It has a color image of a stamp that qualifies as being rare or interesting. And then there is a multicolor vignette of either an event or uh, from the country where the stamp came from. Uh, as you can see here, some of the images are, are rather playful. Some of them are more serious. Uh, some of them are historic. Uh, the first adhesive postage stamp there, there's Roland Hill again on another card uh, with the penny black. Uh, I do have a complete set of these. I was at a, an antiquarian book sale here in Cooperstown and uh, I came across a table where there was a, a complete set of all of these, and I was able to get them for $30 for the entire set. So for less than a dollar a card, um, I can now say I have a penny black and a, um, a penny red and, and some of these other rare postage stamps, including the British Guiana stamp, which you'll see on the last slide, uh, the, pen, uh, the one cent magenta. Uh, again, just just fun postal items uh, that as a collector, I'm just having a lot of fun with when I, when I look at these. Uh, there were, as you saw, a lot of non-tobacco card series, and I'm just starting to go through the Burdick catalogs and some other sources to figure out, were there any philatelic series uh, as well in, in candy and gum and bakery products or whatnot? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, I've just started work. Um, this is from the Anglo-American Chewing Gum co Company. I haven't found out a whole lot about this set yet, but I think there was either 48 or 50 cards featuring uh, different stamps from different countries. And it's, uh, it's just a lot of fun seeing them. And as I get my list together and do more research, um, I will we'll see what comes up and hopefully I'll have a chance to either write about it or publish something with APS as I learn more. Uh, these go to at least the early 1960s. Again, this is a British set from the Twinings Tea Company, 1961. They created two 50 card sets, series one, and series two for a total of 100 cards, which they called rare stamps. Uh, the images you see here are from the second series. Uh, there is a first series, and I do have a complete set of those in my personal collection. Again, at an antiquarian book sale, I came across a dealer who had all 50 of them, and he was looking to get rid of them, and I bought the whole thing for $20. So a set of 50 cards for $20, you can't beat that. And I have, again, a wonderful set of, of images uh, that I have put into my album of these um, cigarette and food cards that feature uh, postal stories behind them. Uh, there are also a number of postcard series. Um, there's been a lot of postcards that have been produced over time, of course, uh, but not as many sets or series or things of that nature. I did find this one from 1905. It's called Postman of the British Empire. 
It uh, includes a uniform postal person uh, delivering mail in different parts of the empire. Sometimes it's in the, the Caribbean where the postal uniform was a pair of shorts and, and a white shirt. Uh, here's uh, Canada where it's a, a little cooler, but there, there's also uh, the different uh, colonies in Africa and India and Asia um, where there were uniform postal uh, people at work. And I think there's about 15 cards in this set. I'm still working to get uh, a complete list together, but they're very colorful. And quite often you can pick these up for between seven and $15 a piece. So again, it's a nice fun thing to collect. So as my research has progressed um, and I, I had to live with the fact that baseball cards were not the centerpiece as I expected them to be. Let's go back and look. What are the, the four lessons that I've learned here? Well, lesson one, socioeconomic changes in America after the Civil War led to the need for product promotion, which mixed with uh, printing technology becoming less expensive and the ability to produce these multicolor images that's where the card genre was created, and that is the foundation for today's million dollar hobby business of card collecting, which is mostly sports cards today. And the cards are produced as the product you are buying. But they started as a product that you were using to promote something else. That's completely changed today. It went from being a promotional tool to the product itself. So that change has happened mostly since World War II, but this is where card collecting started and how it got started. Lesson two, surprise, surprise. Uh, the tobacco companies figured out that sex sells from the earliest days. And of course there was the public outcry about those early cards. Um, but then you have instances here. This is a fun series I've come across. It's called Industries of the States. And if you look real hard, you'll see in the lower right-hand corner that this is the farming and mining industries of the state of Indiana that this young lady is representing. So clearly this card set was produced for the purpose of teaching geography and economics. Uh, I'm sure that's what the tobacco company said anyways. Lesson three, baseball cards were not the dominant genre that I thought they were going to be. Again, see lesson two. Baseball cards would continue to increase in popularity, but they would only dominate the market after World War II. That was huge. I had not expected to learn that, but um, you know that's how it is. Um, we we got to roll with that and just accept the fact that before World War II, baseball cards were in competition with bird cards and flag cards and and stamp cards, and uh, were not necessarily what people were all after like they are today. And lesson four, non-baseball cards remain a very interesting and very affordable hobby. Uh, as you can see from the images I've showed you from the sets I've identified, there are a number of these sets and series that are of interest to philatelists. Um, we stamp collectors, um, you know, we have a, a wide variety of interest, I think, and you can have just as much fun tracking these cards down as you do tracking down stamps from different countries as well. Now, I've been a librarian for 40 years and I've never been able to do a program without having some suggested readings. And so I've got three for you this evening. The first is by this book, Game Faces by Peter Devereaux. Peter is a friend of mine. He works at the Library of Congress and he wrote this book in 2018, whereas the focus is on the early baseball cards. He has a lot of information in here on the, the economic issues that were in play at the time, the cost of the cards, how the cards were created, who was making decisions to print the cards. And he talks about that there were these other genre of cards as well. But of course, this was meant mostly for a baseball audience because that's what a lot of the early cards in the Library of Congress collection consist of, and it's it's a fun book and it's relatively recent. Uh, the second book is from 1999 by Forbes and Mitchell. It's called American Tobacco Cards. It's a price guide and checklist. Now the price guide is a bit dated now. It's 21 years old, of course, but the checklists are fantastic. 
they mention the baseball card sets here, but because there's so much other information available about the baseball cards, their focus is on the other topics. And so this is where you can get an individual list of the N85s uh, and maybe the flag sets and the bird sets and things like that. It's, it's a fantastic resource that I've used as a reference now since it was published in 1999 and my personal copy is pretty well worn out. And then, of course, if you want to go to the master himself, the hero of our story, Jefferson Burdick, his American Card Catalog, which was published up until his death. Uh, and then there was, I think, one or two editions just after he passed away in 1967. These can be difficult to find. Uh, my personal copy I found at the Strand Bookstore in New York City uh, many years ago. I was crawling around on some shelves and found this. And they only wanted $5 for it. And had I found others, I would have bought them all at $5 a copy because this can be very difficult to find, but it is the standard uh, that we go back to, particularly when we want to know what letter combination Burdick was using for the different genres of cards. Uh, so again, a fun little piece. My copy is, is about worn out. I'll be looking for another one soon. And then um, I'll end with this one little quote from Jefferson Burdick that I think a stamp collector will understand as well as a card collector. It's a card collection is a magic carpet that takes you away from workaday cares to havens of relaxing quietude where you can relive the pleasures and adventures of a past day brought to life in vivid pictures and prose. And I think if you took the word card out and stuck the word stamp in there, all of us who collect stamps and enjoy looking at them once they're organized and in our albums, we can appreciate what Jefferson was saying here. And for those of us who collect cards and stamps, um, it's, it's uh, kind of double pleasure for us. And I should give you a little bit more background on, on Jefferson. Uh, he suffered from a debilitating form of arthritis, and he really wasn't able to do much except sit at a desk and organize and work on his cards. I mean, it was a horrible physical situation that he had. And he moved to New York City to help organize his collection for the um, New York Metropolitan Museum of Art. And when he glued the last card into the last album, he got up and struggled to put on his jacket and his hat, and he told the staff, I'm through and I shan't be back, which is an exact quote that has appeared in a, a number of publications. Uh, he left the museum, checked into a hospital uh, the next day, and passed away within the month. His body was returned to Syracuse, New York, where he was buried in a numbered grave. And it wasn't until about 2005 that a group of baseball card collectors uh, took up a collection and raised money in a fund to pay for a proper headstone, which is now uh, at his grave in Syracuse. And it says Jefferson Burdick, um, 1900 to 1967. And it refers to him as the father of card collecting, which I think is well deserved. And with that, let's, whoops, one more. Um, I will finish up uh, by saying thank you for having me. If you want to send me an email, there's my email address. And uh, the two images you see here are a kind of fun juxtaposition of rarity. On the right is, of course, the one cent magenta from British Guyana that appears on the 1939 Art of Tobacco set, which I showed you earlier. This being, of course, the rarest postage stamp where there's only one known copy. And on the left is a Casey Stengel card from the Maple Crispet set of the early 1920s. It's a Canadian set, 35 cards, of which Casey Stengel is card number 15. And if you bought the Maple Crispet cookies and put together a collection of all 35 cards and returned them to the factory, they would send you a ball, a bat, and a glove. And in order to avoid having to buy all that equipment and keep it on site, they only produced one copy of card 15, Casey Stengel. This card made its way into the collector's world about 15 years ago. 
uh, one collector put the, um, a complete set of all 35 cards together and then donated it to the Baseball Hall of Fame here in Cooperstown where I have this card in my collection. So there you have the, the rarest card where there's only one known copy and the rarest stamp where there's only one known copy. So it's kind of fun putting that slide together. And with that, I'm thank you very much. And Heidi, I guess we have time for some questions, correct? We do, we do. I'm, I'm, that was a great presentation. Thank you so much, Jim, thank you. Yes, we will, and friends, for those of you who have not attended uh, a GoTo webinar, just so you know, the questions, you can pose your questions using the question box, or you can use the chat box, um, <clears throat> and I will read your questions aloud. So thank you so much to our participants who have used the question box, and here we go. We have a question, were cards also included with packets of cigarettes? Yes, the, the card was stuck in the middle of the packet to protect the cigarettes from damage in, in uh, shipping or when in someone's pocket. Okay, thank you. And someone that, uh, is making a comment that the ATC, American Tobacco Company, was a monopoly. They controlled the T206 cards through acquisitions, threats, etc. Oh, absolutely. What happened was there were a lot of tobacco companies uh, in the 1880s and early 1890s when the N series was produced. But about 1895, the American Tobacco Company created a monopoly and controlled almost like 98% of the cigarettes made in the country. And they said, hey, we control all the business now. We don't have to make cards anymore. So about 1895, there are no cards until about 1905. So there's 10 years where there were no cards. And in 1905, the trust busters came in and uh, closed down the monopoly. And all of a sudden the American Tobacco Company had competition again. So 1905 is when you start seeing the T series of the 20th century tobacco cards. So yes, when there was a monopoly, there were no cards produced at all. Are the stamps that feature, uh, are there stamps that feature these cards? Um, I'm not aware of any. Um, there have been, because you know, this could be worldwide. I mean, they were producing cards all over the, the world. So any country could have produced them. But I've not seen any stamp that actually commemorates or celebrates the, the tobacco card or the food card or anything else. But that's a great idea for a, uh, a stamp series. I agree. I agree. Uh, another question, Mr. Gates, thank you. What is the title of the Devereaux book? Oh, that is called. Thank you. Well, hold on, we'll get there. Game Faces, Early Baseball Cards from the Library of Congress. And our, our one of our attendees is, is concurring or, or backing up your, there are no stamps that feature the cards. Okay. So, not yet anyway. And what, what, what got you into this? What, what catalyzed your desire to get into these types of cards? Um, well, I was doing it, uh, you know, as librarian at the Baseball Hall of Fame, and with we have about two hundred thousand baseball cards in our collection, and I was just doing background research to figure out how did these things start. Was it, you know, one person who came up with the idea? Well, you know, what was the origination of it. And in the process of discovering how cards were created, that's where I discovered on the side that there were these stamp cards that were also available. And I thought it would be fun to learn about those. And uh, occasionally when I've seen them for sale, I, I pick them up for you know my own personal collection. Where do you find most of these? Just randomly or where? where? 
Um, there are multiple places. The um, N85 set I bought as a single set from an auction house that uh, sells a lot of baseball cards, but in the back of their catalog, uh, they had some of these other categories of cards up for sale, and they had a complete set of the N85, so I just put in a bid and got them. I see individual cards and batches of cards coming up for sale on eBay all the time. And then the, the 1939 set and the Twinings T set from 1961, I just happened to come across uh, in miscellaneous notebooks at uh, different um, antiquarian book sales that I attend from time to time. And you know, I was just lucky in that there were complete sets and you know, it was a great chance. So I, I negotiated a price and picked them up. They, they were in a notebook? Uh, they were in a binder, yeah, it, with a, a binder full of baseball cards, and they were in the back of the binder. And I said, "Hey, you know, here's this 50 card set. How much do you want for them?" And uh, you know, they make an offer, I make a counter offer, and we come to an agreement. And uh, I walk off uh, happy as a clam. Wow, what a find! That's so fun. We have another question here talking about fun. Will you talk a bit about the top bubblegum card? Well, Topps, um, it was uh, the Topps Chewing Gun Company, uh, started really producing cards about 1953-54, and they would include baseball cards as the way to sell their gum. And they became the biggest producer of baseball cards through the 60s and into the 70s when they stopped in including the gum because it was causing damage to the baseball cards and just started selling the cards as the product itself. And they still exist today and are still the biggest producer of baseball cards. From about 1955 to 1975, they had an absolute monopoly of cards. Um, they had the only license from Major League Baseball. Uh, and then in the late 70s, a number of other companies stepped in and started producing cards as well. And that's when, you know, the card production really got out of hand. Um, and I think I looked it up in, in 2001, Ichiro Suzuki's rookie year in Major League Baseball. There were more cards produced by more companies than Henry Aaron and Willie Mays had in their entire careers. Uh, wow. So that gives you an idea of how the production numbers have changed over time. Wow. Wow. That is a, that is a big number. Moving along. Okay, this is good. We're getting juices flowing over here in our questions. Um, someone did want to say that the closest to a card stamp is Dick Schaefer's design. For the 2010 USPS Negro Baseball Leagues that feature partial images from trade cards. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, are there tobacco cards that were signed by baseball players? Um, Good question. For the most part, the tobacco cards ended about 1917, um, and that's before the autograph craze uh, really hit for sports figures. So there aren't that many autographed cards. And if you do um, see them, actually an autograph lowers the value of the card. Um, it, instead of the card value, it has the autograph value, which in many cases is less than, than the rarity of, of the card without the autograph. And one of our friends is is letting us know that the tops is located in Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania. We did not yep. know that. Yeah, still producing. Oh yeah, um, there are so many fun stories of tops cards. Uh, my favorite being uh, the Mickey Mantle rookie card, which is considered very rare and very valuable today. And one of the reasons that it's uh, valuable is that Topps had a whole bunch of them that they couldn't sell that rookie year because he was a high numbered card, which doesn't become available until the end of the season. And the ones that they didn't sell, they loaded up in a barge and took out the sea and, and just tossed them in the ocean, uh, which is why the Mickey Mantle rookie card 
uh, is is so hard to find and so valuable. All the way up into the ocean, unbelievable. <laughs> so, what are are there are there societies are there collectors groups for this sort of cartog? What was the what was the term that you used, Car? For the baseball cards, there are all types of, of groups and organizations of collectors and all. For the non-baseball cards, I'm not aware of any particular organization. I know a lot of individuals who are interested in them. Uh, in Great Britain, they have something called the Royal Cardophilic Society. Um, cardophilia being uh, lovers of of card collecting, of course. Um, and they have a, um, an organization with a membership and a catalog that they produce. Um, but, um, I'm not aware of any similar thing in our country here. Do you have a particular style that you, that that's your favorite, say for like the food cards or the tobacco cards? Do you well, have favorite? I'm interested in, uh, any stamp collecting set, uh, anything that talks about postal issues or postage stamps or anything like that. Uh, I also have an interest in other topics like flags and maps and military medals and, you know, reading about those and seeing about them, but I don't actively collect those, just the ones on postage stamps. Do you have any idea why, what, I mean, have you come across anything of why stamps were put onto these cards was it were they were they very popular and hence uh they could they thought that that would increase its sellability that's a real good question i have been doing research on that on that n85 series which again is the only one that, that had real postage stamps on it um i haven't been able to find out who came up with the idea but you're talking in the late 1880s stamp collecting was just starting to take off as well and i think that the company was trying to take advantage of this interest in collecting postage stamps uh to get people to buy their tobacco product and of course by creating an album where you could put both the cards and the stamps uh you know they were hoping to to get multiple markets there focused on their product what a different era, different time. It's interesting to think about what was used for for marketing. Yeah. And keep in mind, um, mass marketing was being invented uh, on almost a, a daily basis here. So they were trying all different types of things uh, to see what would sell their product. And of course, the big thing, of course, were the, the Acris cards in the early days. But when the public demanded something else, that's when you see these cards going off in all different types of directions with different topics. And I think they were trying to figure out what helps sell their product best. Well, and then I remember we were talking and and, and this at this sort of marketing and advertising really fed into that desire, that human desire to collect. Because I had asked, why would people buy? What what was so special? But you said people inherently love to collect. Um, prior to the creation of these inexpensive uh, mass-produced uh, material, only rich people could collect things: statues, artwork, uh, furniture, whatnot. It was. Um, just very difficult uh, for the average working person to have money to collect things. But as society and the socioeconomic started to change after the Civil War, um, you know, you had the ability to produce things that people could collect that would help sell your product. And of course, I think collecting is just a, a natural activity for humans. And the companies took advantage of this to create these cards. Thank you. That that really helps to make sense. Uh, yes. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, while we're, uh, I'll share some thoughts and questions here from the box. If you could put your email address back up. Mr. Sure. Uh, it, 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 an attendee is letting us know that as an FYI, currently eBay has a complete set of Duke cards with stamps, 50 for $725 along with a good deal of singe item sales, single item sales. 
Yeah, eBay is a great source for these cards. Um, uh, I, I go there all the time just to see what's being sold. Yeah. What country? Yeah, I could also mention, uh, Heidi, I think I might have shared this with you before. On YouTube, there's a great 15-minute video called Why Do We Collect? Um, it was made by um, a young man who grew up here in Cooperstown, and he talks a lot about Jefferson Burdick and his collection and the material at the Metropolitan Museum, but it kind of goes into the psychology of why people collect things. Why people collect things. Uh, the email, uh, friends on the line, I just put into the chat box. It is jgates at baseball.org. If you can't, baseball.org. Baseball excuse me. And it is in the chat box. Uh, there were fabulous player team postcard series issued between 1905 and 1914. This is an interesting area of postal history, but in an extremely expensive one. Oh, yeah. If you're looking for any cards uh, related to baseball players and baseball teams, you have to have a pretty thick wallet. Um, and it, it's ridiculously expensive sometimes, which is why I kind of like these other topics, because uh, much more affordable. Oh, Great question. Do we find any counterfeits? For baseball cards, there are some known counterfeits out there. For the other sets, not so much because they're just, um, they're not priced enough to make a counterfeit. So for the most part, if you're buying something at five to $10 a card, nobody's gonna bother counterfeiting those. <laughs> We've learned well, a lot. If you're talking about that. a baseball card for a hundred thousand dollars, you got to be careful. Wow! But any of, but in terms of the any of these cards that you've shown us, that would there would have would there have been a need to make a counterfeit or some sort no, of? A, they they just up? they're not they're not uh, worth enough to to make it worth the effort to uh, create a counterfeit. Well, I think we might be ending on that that question but that one tickled me <laughs> thank you oh jim it's been great friends this is another hour of stamp chat thank you so much for joining us as i mentioned in the chat box or at the beginning of the the stamp chat one of the fantastic member services that you get upon membership with the american philatelic society is access to the aprl that's the american philatelic reference library, um, and I, I am sure that one of our media specialists would be happy to help you if this is something that's piqued your curiosity and interest. You can just go to stamps.org, go to the library, and you'll have all sorts of contact information for any media specialist who could help you in, your collect, in, in finding new references, and certainly you can check out the digital library to see if anything is available for there to you uh, for you to, to to dive into. And as Mr. J, uh, Mr. Gates has given you his email address, I'm sure he, he's he's a librarian, so he he's all about sharing references and resources. So do give him an email if you'd like. Drop him an email. Um, you're getting many accolades, Mr. Gates, in our question and chat box. So thank you very much for for this incredible presentation that was really new and everyone was very excited um, to be on the call. Thank you, Fred. Well, thank you for having me. This has been fun. Oh, it's been great. And uh, again, Mr. Jim Gates, he is an APS member as well as a longtime 25-year librarian for the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Mr. Gates, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on Stamp Chat. And friends, remember, again, as you're part of your membership, you get to uh, have a subscription to the AP, and you can find our interview with Mr. Gates by our editor, Tom Lovig. So thank you so much again, and we will see you on our next APS Stamp Chat. Good night, everyone.